So welcome everybody to the, this um, climate change uh, transcontinental uh, discourse. Um, I would like to thank the um, Consulate General of Portugal in San Francisco, uh, the Institute of European Studies. Uh, I would like to thank your presence as well, my colleague Delinda Down for being present here today. And this is a part of event organized um, with the Consulate General of Portugal um, for this new uh, series um, called uh, Bridging, um, Bridging the West Coast European Union in Berkeley. So this is our first event of this series. And I would like with no further delay to uh, introduce and invite uh, our Consul General in San Francisco, Dr. Pedro Pinto, to give a couple of words about this um, event. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Duarte. Uh, thank you very much also to Diolinda uh, and Jeroen, which were uh, very important in making uh, this uh, series happen. Uh, Portugal, as uh, European Union local chair, uh, felt it would be important uh, to develop a partnership uh, with the university that has the prestige and the outreach uh, capacity of, of Berkeley uh, to uh, share what is the current status of some Where of the things. Excuse me? It's, it's, it's working? It's working. Mm -hmm. um, to share what is the current status of some of the main issues um, in terms of uh, political priorities of the European Union. And um, we felt that there would be no better uh, subject than climate to start uh, this series. Uh, last weekend's uh, events, weather events uh, here in, in California and around the Bay Area in particular showed quite well the relevance uh, and uh, the, the consequence uh, of the issue. Um, and I would uh, very much like to thank uh, Professor Matthias Kondov for his availability as well as uh, my former colleague in Brussels and good friend, João Sarmento, for being available for this uh, first conference. Without uh, further ado, I uh, will uh, conclude my remarks. Uh, just thank you very much. And I very much uh, hope that this will be uh, useful for those attending. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pedro Pinto. I'll uh, pass the word then to my colleague, Dilinda Dan. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this most important debate. Um, we hope that um, not only are we able to bring forth the policies that uh, the European Union and the United States are trying to develop uh, regarding uh, the control of climate change, but, um, but also um, can help us see forward on a path that perhaps can make it all improve. And we have two fantastic guests and our guests today are Professor uh, Matthias Kondal from UC Berkeley and um, Dr. Joan Sarmento from the European Union. And I will begin to introduce Professor Kondal who is uh, professor of Landscape, Architecture, and Environmental Planning at UC Berkeley. He is a fluvial geomorphologist. He's a professor of environmental planning and co-director of the Global Metropolitan Studies Program at the University of California, Berkeley. He is a fellow of the Collegium Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Lyon, France, and a member of the International Scientific Board for the École Universitaire de Recherche des Sciences de l'Etat de l'E, Ide Hydrosystem, uh, also in Lyon. He teaches courses on hydrology, river restoration, environmental planning, and environmental science. Professor Kondolf researches human river interactions and in including management, managing flood uh, prone lands, urban rivers, sediments in rivers and reservoirs, and river restoration. He has re recently developed new research areas in the social connectivity of urban rivers, analyzing the city, uh, city river relationships over time and current urban river revitalization efforts, the social life of the sediment balance, examining river basin impacts of dams on downstream rivers and deltas, 
from both geomorphological and environmental history perspectives and strategic dam planning for improved trade-offs between hydropower generation and the environment. Author of over a hundred peer-reviewed papers and three books, his work has been published in leading journals and he has advised governments and non-governmental organizations on sustainable management of rivers around the world, providing expert testimony before the US Congress, the California Legislature, Legislature, the California Water Resources Control Board, the US Supreme Court, the International Court of Justice, and the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the HOG, and many in in many other in and in other areas. Uh, we're very pleased to have him with us. And I must say that what I've just read is but a short, short um, description of his work. And I would also like to introduce uh, his interlocutor for this event, Dr. João Sarmento, who is the coordinator of the Portuguese permanent representation to the U U European Union for climate and energy. He has been following the climate since 2017 as an attache of the Portuguese permanent representation to the European Union. During the Portuguese presidency, he was the coordinator for the Environment and Energy Unit, and he was particularly involved in the negotiations of the EU climate law, coordinating these negotiations at the technical level. His previous experience includes working as a policy officer in the State Secretary for Land Planning and Nature Conservation, and he was head of the Environmental and Sustainability Department of the Portuguese Road and Rail Network. He began his active work life in the North Region State Department for Regional Development in Portugal, where ultimately he became responsible for the Environmental Impact Access Unit. Graduating in Mining Engineering with a Master's Degree in Management and Technologies of Natural Resources, both from Porto at the, the, the School of Engineering at the University of Porto, which is a great school. I've had the opportunity to spend some time there and had a great, uh, have great memories. Um, and um, without, again, he has um, a lot of work that has impacted um, a lot of researchers as well. Too many to mention at this point. So I would like to begin their presentations by inviting Professor Kondoff to take the reins and, um, and be the first to speak on this matter. Professor Kondoff, are you there and ready? Indeed, it's always a challenge to find the mute button so you can, you can go live. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a, a pleasure to be here and um, Dale Linda didn't mention perhaps my most uh, um, important uh, attribute is that I'm the former chair of the Portuguese Studies Program, now Center for Portuguese Studies. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's basically because of my enthusiasm for, um, for Portugal and for the opportunities that we have to learn from comparisons between California and Portugal with these two Mediterranean climates uh, both of which have a, essentially the same hydrology. There are minor differences, but uh, uh, it, and to me, it's always fascinating to see how we have responded to similar challenges, but often in very different ways. Um, and today, I'm, I want to talk a little bit about a comparison that my uh, PhD student, Pedro Pinto, who's now at uh, Technical, comparison that he did as part of his dissertation looking at the vulnerability of San Francisco Bay and the Tagus Estuary, comparing their vulnerability to sea level rise impacts. And um, I think it's, uh, it's quite, I think it's quite a remarkable story. So let me begin, um, I'll share my screen here if this works. Yes, okay. Um, so it's, uh, it's a tale of two cities these two urban estuaries and how differently they developed and the consequences that we see today and actually not even so much today but we will see in the future as the sea level goes up so i don't need to belabor this point but just to remind you that sea level rise has accelerated in a really extraordinary way just since the 1970s and um 
since we don't seem to be getting our act together globally to control emissions, uh, we can look into the future and expect at least a meter of sea level rise in addition by 2100, probably two, uh, if we assume a, a relatively high emission scenario, which, which seems likely at this point. So before we look at what impact this will have on the existing landscape, we can think about how the landscape came to be and uh, how these two estuaries evolved up to the present. About 12,000 years ago was a glacial maxima, we call it. It was a period in which the glaciers uh, were at their largest extent. Well, we had ice sheets across much of North America and, and uh, Northern Central Europe. Um, and as a result, all this water was locked up in the ice and the sea level was much lower. And uh, at that time, the Tagus River was just a river flowing through what's now the valley, but the center of the valley, in the same way the Sacramento River was just a river flowing through what is now San Francisco Bay. And the, the coast of, uh, of the Pacific coast off of San Francisco was uh, where the Farallon Islands are now, so something like 40 or 50 kilometers offshore. So that's what it looked like 12,000 years ago during a low stand of sea level of glacial maxima. Then the glaciers melted, the sea level started to come up. About 4,000 years ago, it looked like this. And these dark areas are the areas that were under tidal influence, so they would have been mostly tidal marshes at that time. And of course, this continued uh, uh, this is uh, about a thousand years, and this was 1800. So really just before the gold rush and all the things changed in, in um, San Francisco, uh, in California, uh, in, in Lisbon, um, you know, the, the land uses were still uh, pretty traditional at that point. And so we can see the, uh, the distribution of these tidal wetlands fringing the estuaries. So very, very important features. Um, what it looks like today, something quite different. We have um, extensive uh, fill that's been done um, throughout. Um, and um, in the San Francisco Bay, much of this area has been converted into, um, into fill. Um, here we look and see the, the areas of artificial fill around the margins of the Tagus Estuary and San Francisco Bay. There's a lot more red. There's a lot more artificial fill around the San Francisco Bay. Uh, very little around the, the Tagus Estuary. In fact, it's mostly right along the, the city of Lisbon, some of the industrial areas like the and the other on the other side. Um, and these are mostly uh, associated with a port development, navigational infrastructure but much less extensive than what you see in San Francisco Bay, which is uh, extensive filling of what were formerly very shallow waters of, of, of tidal, tidal wetlands and very shallow waters in the bay and dense urban development being built on these places. Um, if you can see my cursor down this part of the bay in Mountain View, uh, towns like that, that's where of course we have Facebook and Google, all these, uh, internet powerhouses are all built on this uh, artificial debris that was dumped there. Along the Tagus estuary, it was very different. Here, all the tidal lands and an additional zone were reserved for the crown and used mostly for livestock grazing and other agricultural uses. The Lizirias, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But along San Francisco Bay, um, very different uh, regulation, very different management of the land. There's something called the Swamp Lands Act passed in 1850 by Congress, and it gave these lands to the state of California. So basically all these tidal lands were given to the states and California, as typical of many of the states, sold them off for $1 an acre. $1 an acre. They were eager to have these things built on. Um, and until the 1960s, there was no control on filling the bay and it was done extensively. So here's a view, all this pink area in San Francisco and the blue as well, that's all artificial fill that has been done. So what does this mean? Um, we compare the Tagus estuary on the top 
we have mud flats and the salt marsh. These are the typical features you see in a in the tidal estuary margin. Um, and all that was in the public domain up to this point, about 50 meters inland from the water's edge, the high water edge, the high tide line. Uh, and then there was an additional 500 meters uh, that had some land use controls. Look at the San Francisco Bay for the, exactly the same features at the edge of the salt marsh is where um, th that would be the limit of, uh, of the public trust doctrine where, where there would be a, a right for people to access and things like that. Um, and the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, which is kind of the best thing we have going, they only control 30 meters inland from that. So when you look at these diagrams, you see with a little bit of, of sea level rise here, like a, like a you know, one to two meters of sea level rise, in the Tagus estuary, you're fine. You've got areas that can be flooded. These uh, mudflats and salt marshes can migrate up and inland. Whereas in the San Francisco Bay, that can't happen. These mudflats and salt marshes are gonna be drowned out and you're gonna have waves battering whatever kind of a seawall that you have built here. Another view of the Lazeras in, uh, in uh, the Tagus estuary. So a, a, a much better situation to have than what we've inherited in the San Francisco Bay with the, our current uh, urban development on landfill. Now, what does this mean for the future? Well, um, Pedro did a, an assessment of vulnerability to sea level rise comparing both the Tagus estuary and uh, the San Francisco Bay. And it was an analysis taking um, the elevations, uh, the land uses, the wetlands, and then superimposing these uh, higher sea levels. And we see that the, with about um, uh, one meter above current sea level, uh, you have um, these, these kinds of areas are, are inundated. Um, and uh, this is really the, the key one here. We see these, uh, so in, th in this case, the blue are already tidal wetlands. But here with two meters of sea level rise, you're starting to inundate a lot of built up areas. Now the idea is, oh, well, we can build dikes like in the Netherlands and keep all this out, but you can't uh, stop the water tables from going up in the groundwater. And so, uh, so there, there, that's not really a solution. We are gonna have amazingly bad headaches dealing with, uh, with these, uh, these impacts. Um, and that again is not something uh, that's gonna be much of a problem along the Tagus estuary. You can see a few areas that are red here that uh, are built up and will be inundated with the same kind of, uh, of sea level rise, but mostly it's farmland. And, uh, and that's much easier to deal with in terms of, uh, of having this migration of these uh, tidal wetlands. So uh, those are my comments, I thought that uh, could be interesting to ground our discussion a little bit. Sea level rise is one of the most important impacts that, uh, that we will have with uh, the climate change that's unfolding before our very eyes. Uh, and um, I think it's, uh, I mean, I, I find it fascinating to, to see this comparison between Lisbon and San Francisco. And Joao, I'd be very curious um, if you could um, uh, think about how Porto would uh, would would fit into that? How how much similar it would be to the uh, the Lisbon uh, estuary situation? Well, thank you, Professor Karnoff. I did I did forget to mention uh, your chairmanship, which lasted for um, over a decade, and uh, which uh, we did together. It was uh, a lot of fun, among other things. And also, neither of us mentioned about all the time you've spent in Portugal with students. Um, go studying different uh, areas in Portugal. Uh, so it, uh, where we also had a lot of fun while you know, a lot of good work was done. Thank you so much for your presentation and for your interest in, uh, in our specificities of our climates. And so now we pass um, to Dr. João Sarmento who um, will present his presentation and then possibly engage in a small exchange with um, trying to address the question posed by Professor Condolf. 
Well, good morning to all. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, I will uh, try to address the question. I don't think I will be able to in such precise terms, uh, Professor Matt Kronoff, which I already uh, would like to greet. I will also start by saying that it's an honor for the Portuguese represent, uh, representation to participate in this event. And I would like to thank uh, the Institute of European Studies, of course, in Berkeley and the Center of Portuguese Studies, and also the Consulate uh, General of Portugal for, uh, for inviting us to participate. And I would like to greet all the participants in, in the event. I will try to um, share my screen as well because I prepared a presentation. I hope you can see it at this point. Okay, uh, so let me see if I can move on. Oh, here we are. These were the questions that uh, uh, Duarte uh, and the program asked me to try to address in this presentation and I will try to uh, dive into a little bit uh, of uh, what is the, the, the point of the, the uh, where we are at this point when we're discussing the climate legislation in the EU, also focus a little bit on the climate law and uh, what we call uh, uh, the Fit for 55 package. And I'll move on later on and I'll explain what this me actually means. Um, <clears throat> let me just uh, do a little recap and uh, try to explain where we are and how we got here because um, as you can probably see from this slide, um, I have a timeline. And here, I'd like to start by pointing out uh, the fact that uh, uh, there's three things that I'm trying to represent in this slide. It's the, the political cycle, uh, the policy cycle when, when it comes to uh, climate, and uh, the financial cycle. So all of these cycles are absolutely fundamental uh, because um, when we're talking about uh, policy, clearly we're aligning the way for our, for our actions uh, and uh, they are translated into a set of decisions that influence uh, the climate legislation and processes in, in the EU. But it, it's also very much linked to the, the financial frameworks um, because most of what we do has to do with, with the investments. So picking up on, on uh, 2014, the year where we had the definition of the, the, first, um, uh, the first definition of what would be the EU's 2030 uh, climate targets. Um, this was clearly the year before COP21. So the Paris Agreement that was uh, uh, celebrated in 2015 by all the, in the international community. So this was in um, 2014, we had set the first commitment for 2030, uh, which in our case in the EU was to be a, a reduction of 40% in of, of emissions where compared to the, uh, the year of 1990. So this is what we translated into our first nationally determined contribution. And this was our commitment uh, beyond the Paris Agreement until um, December last year. Um, we are started off um, in 2016, 2018, 2019, we finished the discussion of the first package of uh, implementing legislation, which is quite vast, and we will come to that in the future. But um, immediately, uh, while we were finishing the discussion of, of, this, uh, of this implementing legislation and focusing on the target for 2030, we started uh, the discussions on what became the European Union's long-term strategy and what was the vision for this long-term strategy, which we knew we had to submit uh, by the end of 2020. And so in 2019, September 2019, the Union took the decision to be uh, climate neutral, I'm sorry, uh, the, the decision to be climate neutral by 2050. Um, this was a very important mark because it's much more uh, objective, it's what we can do things much more objectively by knowing exactly where we want to land. And this helps us um, uh, define our policies in a much more objective way. Um, here again, I'll step up to the, the blue section of this, uh, this, uh, this slide where we uh, signal the fact that we had uh, European elections in 2019. Sorry, there's a little mistake there, but in 2019, we uh, had a new commission coming in um, and Ms. Ursula von der Leyen in her political program 
decided that the EU becoming climate neutral will become would become the cornerstone of uh, the European policy. This had an enormous impact. Uh, it was to some extent quite unexpected, but it matched very well with the fact that we had uh, a decision of being uh, becoming the first uh, climate neutral uh, big economy, a developed economy. Um, this, of course, triggered uh, uh, an array of events. Uh, the first one was to be climate neutral, the EU had to align uh, its first intermediate target, the, the 2030 target, with this pathway, with a sustained pathway to be climate neutral, which meant that we had to revisit uh, our 2030 target. And so September last year, um, the, the European Commission proposed uh, a climate target plan, the 20, uh, 2030 climate uh, plan, which was presented in 2020. And this allowed our leaders to revisit uh, and to enhance the, our 2030 target from 40% to 55%, because this is what would uh, place us on a sustainable pathway and a robust pathway to become climate neutral by 2050. Part of the program of uh, Mr. Silva van der Leyen's uh, political program um, uh, was defined uh, in, in, the, in this way. And the, one of the major outputs would be to enshrine into law these objectives, the climate neutrality uh, objective of uh, 2050, as well as the first intermediate uh, target, the revised intermediate target of 2030, uh, set for a level of 55%. And this is how we came to call the Fit for 55 package, which is the, the legislative package that we are now addressing and that would realign every legislative proposal that we had from the 40% to the 50, 55% in 2030. Um, this also happened uh, while we were discussing the multi-financial framework. And the decision on the multi-financial framework uh, was very much aligned with the objective of our 2030 targets. And the, the decision was made at the same time. And this happened in December. Of course, we were living through the pandemic. And on top of this, we, um, we added uh, what is called the Next Generation EU, which is a specific program dedicated to, uh, to help the European economy recover from the effects of the pandemic. And uh, the bigger decision here was that we shouldn't, uh, uh, we shouldn't let ourselves astray from the purpose of combating climate change. Instead, what the decision was, we should front load most of these measures because the pandemic is an unfortunate event climate change will be here to last and we have to deal with it. So the decision here was to uh, front load most of these measures. But it doesn't stop here. We will have elections coming in 2024. Uh, we now have a process set in the climate law uh, by way of which in uh, mid 2024, we will be looking at our 2040 target and once again, realigning our, all our legislation for that 2040 target. Then we will have of course, another multi-financial framework in 2027. So just this, this to say, it's important to bear in mind the political cycle, the, the climate cycle, and also the financial cycle. And these things have to be aligned in order for all of this process to work out. And it's an ongoing process. It never ends. In three years time, we will start discussions on our 2040 target. But why are we doing this? Why, uh, why is uh, the, uh, the European Union engaging so actively on, on, on climate? And here I would like to point out, first of all, to Mr. Sula van der Leyen's, uh, the Commission's political program and how it translated to the European Green Deal, which is, goes beyond a climate. It has climate as the cornerstone of the development uh, of the European Green Deal, but it goes beyond that. Um, and so here, the, the, the three main elements were, first of all, uh, realizing that um, the EU has been severely impacted with uh, climate ex extreme weather events that are more and more frequent, droughts in my country, floods in other parts of the EU, uh, heat waves uh, leading to forest fires, which also unfortunately affect us quite a lot. Uh, loss of lives and property. We had extreme weather events this year 
in Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands uh, with water rampaging and this, uh, completely changing our landscapes and loss of soil and, of course, water resources. Uh, we are quite used to seeing Mr. Timmermans, our uh, executive vice president, saying that he, he fears that the future wars will be over water. So, but this is something that we feel. On the other hand, our citizens have uh, been uh, more and more uh, concerned about uh, the effects of climate change. Nine, the, nine out of 10 Europeans uh, consider climate change to be uh, one of the major problems in the EU. And now uh, in the most recent uh, uh, survey from the Eurobarometer, uh, the interesting thing to point out is one out of every five now regard climate change as the first world threat. Um, so citizens are very much aware of this and they think this is a very serious problem. And the European Green Deal pulls out another dimension is that there's a, a, a business case uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, the climate challenges that we have and the way that um, the, the European, European businesses who have uh, invested in, in environment and environmental products and solutions have a leading role in the world. And this uh, also means that there is a business case when it comes to, to the environment. So these are the three main axes of sustainability. And um, this is what the European Green Deal builds on. So frankly, what did we commit to in our climate law when we enshrined the net zero uh, objective uh, by 2050 here? This is just a, a representation, but what we, need, what we need to know is that by 2050, our emissions in the EU have to be less than what uh, the, the, uh, Spain's emissions are nowadays. This is how much we have to reduce in order to balance our emissions with our sink capacity, which could be around 300 to 400 million tons. So this is the equivalent of uh, Spain's emissions. Um, it's a challenging uh, process. We have decided to do this domestically. It's an economy-wide approach, so all the sectors of the economy have to uh, participate in this effort. And of course, um, uh, this led to, as I said, um, uh, now that we have a long-term objective, and now that we've updated our targets for 2030, now that we've enshrined these targets in this objective into law, now that we have the financial resources, at least for 2027 at our disposal, with the front loading of next generation EU, we are now at the point where we have to revise all this legislation. And here you see, uh, this is a, a, an image that the Com European Commission uses a lot. All the things that we have to do and to align to uh, be able to reach our 2030 target and be fit for 55. I have uh, another representation, a little bit more schematic. It's my own, so I'll use this one. And just to give you an idea, um, we call this the, the triangle, the, the climate triangle here you see represented in the, in the middle. Um, and here we have on the three vertices, we have uh, the European trading system. Um, uh, the European trading system nowadays just uh, involves stationary installations for industry and the production of electricity. Um, but now with the, the new uh, approach that we will uh, implement, we will also have intra-EU flights under the ETS and also uh, maritime sector. What is the ETS? It's a market measure. It, uh, um, it establishes a, a carbon price, a price on carbon, and uh, operators have to buy uh, the allowances that they need to compensate for the emissions and annually surrender these allowances. Um, Still looking into the, the triangle, you will find another very important element, which is here represented by the ESR. So this is um, uh, the effort sharing regulation. It's a completely different measure from the ETS because it's uh, focused on um, national measures and it uh, involves 60% of the, of the EU's emissions. And notably, we're looking into waste management, agriculture, uh, buildings and transport uh, in, in, in this universe. So it's a complementary measure to the ETS. And then we have the other uh, vertex of the, uh, the triangle, which is LUCF, it's land use, land use change and forestry. 
And here we're talking about our sinks and um, the need that we have to, first of all, uh, stop the decline of our sink capacity, increase our sinks in the EU. The Fit for 55 package um, involves also creating a price signal on fuels used on vehicles and households and buildings. And this is the new ETS building and road transport that you see represented um, on top next to the ETS. This is one of the elements that we have in, this, in the discussions. But then we, were, we are also uh, uh, in this, con this area of pricing on carbon, looking into the energy taxation directive, whereby fuels in Europe will, will be taxed according to their um, uh, their carbon content and not only on the volume. Um, so this is an alignment that we have to do in our pricing instruments. And then there's a lot of uh, measures that are addressed, specifically addressed to standards, renewable energies that you see here on the, on the side of the blue arrow, uh, energy efficiency standards that we have to increase, but also um, uh, addressing elements such as uh, light duty vehicles, and uh, uh, reducing emissions from, uh, uh, from uh, transport in general, but with a particular focus on uh, light duty vehicles because they represent 75% uh, of the road transport emissions. Uh, we're looking into uh, alternative fuels infrastructure uh, regulation to uh, promote uh, the, 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 the installation of more um, alternative fuels, charging points, electricity, hydrogen. And of course, we are looking into uh, fuels for maritime sectors and also for aviation. So it, as you can see, it's a quite an overwhelming package of legislation, uh, mostly focused on reducing emissions from all the sectors of the economy and particularly for buildings and transport where we have unfortunately have seen an, an increase in emissions contrary to the other side, to the other areas of, of our economy. So in a nutshell, I'm sorry, I probably took a little more time than I expected. This is uh, how we are addressing at uh, this point uh, our uh, intense activity, legislative activity to try to realign our objectives and to put us on a sustainable path uh, to climate neutrality by 2050. Thank you very much. And I will be very much available to address the questions and. Picking up on Professor Matthias's uh, uh question about Porta, I just would like to uh, say something very relevant. I didn't talk about the loss of coastal area, but this is another problem that we have in our country. And it's very important impacting on our economy because as you know, Portugal is also a, a place of sun, sand and sea. So uh, it's impressive to see how uh, most of these activities and most of these impacts will have direct impact on our economies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, could you? I'll try. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> These things are always a little tricky. Let me see. Oh. I'm sorry because I, I'm not uh, so much of a, an expert on uh, Zoom, I'm afraid. I am right, well, I'm you... with you right there on that. <laughs> I always get frustrated. On the green button. Okay. Well. Yeah, there <laughs> you go. You've just become an expert. Congratulations. Um, this was extremely interesting because we we first heard about um, the consequences and then of what could happen. And then we heard about policies that are trying to be put in place in order to minimize uh, or hopefully avoid many of those consequences. And that was uh, for a lay person such as myself, a lay person in this matter, it, 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 was, it was very interesting. Um, we, I would like to first invite you each to comment on each other's presentation uh, before we can um, address any other questions. So Professor Kondoff, um, would you, do you have any thoughts that you would like to share with, it, with us now? Well, just um, very briefly, I, I uh, admire Joao being able to keep track of all these uh, programs and political cross currents and, uh, and then the financial uh, realities and the financial instruments that can be used. Um, I think uh, by comparison, predicting 
how much uh, uh, intertidal zone is going to be flooded uh, with a given sea level rise is probably a fairly simple job. <laughs> but uh, um, and and I uh, and I know I know this is very political, and we're fortunate that the EU has been really uh, shown a lot of leadership on this issue globally, and um, and I think always um, the Portuguese have been. Um, very prominent in in all these uh, efforts, so it's uh, it's great to see. Thank you. Um, I would kind of like to start the discussion with one of the questions on chat, and this is um, by our friend and colleague, uh, Professor Maria Calape Maria Ovida Calapes, and she has a question for Dr. João Sarmento, and the. The question is as such, to my knowledge, the EU has stricter rules on sustainability issues, circular economy, et cetera. What is the European Union doing with which policies are developing to educate those worldwide who don't have any sustainability policies? So does, does in other words, does the European Union have sort of an outreach program to reach areas uh, that are not as engaged politically uh, and, and policy-wise engaged as the European Union is? And if there, are, if there are those policies of outreach, what are they? Um, this is a very interesting question, I have to tell you. I, I, um, I wish I could uh, be able to give you a, a more precise answer on this. I, I've uh, been focusing very much on on uh, internal policy. Uh, I have colleagues who I meet almost every day who reach out and talk to me about uh, what, uh, what can the European Union do about uh, um, most of the member states or most of the countries who, which, with whom we, we interact around the world. And I see them uh, uh, building uh, protocols, programs all the time. And it's interesting to see, although I cannot objectively uh, answer to the question, it's interesting to see how much um, uh, this, this, uh, this dimension of uh, uh, bringing our expertise to other uh, countries has increased. I have more and more questions uh, about uh, uh, programs and what we can do, uh, partnerships uh, in, in, uh, in um, uh, sharing this, this information. I think it's also a challenge that we have internally. Uh, the EU uh, speaks as one, we act as one, but uh, it's, in, it's also important to bear in mind that uh, even inside we have to somehow uh, bring everybody to par and bring everybody together in, in, in this uh, challenge that we have. Um, we learn a lot from each other. Every, every member state has their own, uh, their own idiosyncrasies, I would say, but uh, this is a, a, something that uh, I think is very, very present. And I, I, I feel from, from uh, the outreach from my colleagues that uh, is becoming more and more frequent. Uh, but I, this is what I can say at this point. Thank you so much. I actually have a personal curiosity uh, and this may seem very rudimentary, but and maybe a combination of either, either one of you could maybe answer this very silly question that I have. Um, often when we talk about climate change, we talk about coastal uh, areas. And I oh, think about countries such as Switzerland and Austria that don't have coastal areas, but would be substantially impacted because they actually have great glaciers. Uh, they have portions of their country that remains frozen all the time. And if those, uh, a lot of that, a large volume of that ice melts, how will the, the river flow and the, the water flow through those countries, almost at the source of some of the largest rivers in Europe, how will, what kind of effect can that have on those countries and societies, down, not just there, but downstream? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. And um, I guess we would expect that in the, the countries with the glaciers that are disappearing, that yeah. uh, 
that they're going to be shedding that water pretty fast since they they tend to be mountainous and um, you know there's steep slopes, but uh, but certainly some of the areas downstream and um, we'll be getting this increased runoff and um, a transient feature because of course once it's gone it's it's gone um, and um, I I haven't seen a lot of work on that trying to quantify what what the impact is that we expect to see but in terms of floods or something like that but but certainly very important when the glaciers actually disappear then that will cut off this very important source of low flows in the summer and fall which we call base flows right. which are which are are essential for you know much of the ecosystem and mm -hmm. uh, i mean you'll still get a little bit draining from groundwater but you won't have that that steady melting of the snow that was a, sort of a reliable um, minimum mm -hmm. flow for, for these rivers. So that, that's definitely an impact that, uh, and I think we've already seen that documented oh, in some places where the glaciers have actually completely disappeared. Excellent, uh, thank you. I actually, I guess maybe it was not as silly as I thought. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, we have another question, which is, uh, besides the Treaty of Paris, what other climate projects and agreements are being developed between the US and the EU? And again, either one of you can address that. Well, um, if, if Matthias would uh, allow me just a, a very brief comment on that. I, um, I think here the issue might be uh, the Treaty of Paris is uh, precisely uh, what we need now uh, to, to focus on. Uh, I know that I can imagine there are a lot of initiatives, there always were, they, even in the recent past, uh, uh, between uh, organizations, uh, be them governments or even uh, businesses. And I know that there's been quite a lot of cooperation uh, between the United States and the EU. Um, but uh, I think here I would really like to focus on the challenge that we have in COP26 uh, because uh, it's high time that uh, we actually uh, got our ambition realigned with, uh, with what uh, we need to achieve in the Paris Agreement. And I think uh, Professor Matt Karloff can, can also uh, shed some light on this. It's completely different when we point out point our ambition to two degrees centigrade uh, or 1.5 degrees centigrade it, uh, it's very important that we get as close as possible to 1.5 percent uh, degree centigrade we have this uh, this uh, very clear um, challenge to get this ambition right uh, the most recent uh, information that i have is that uh, if we sum up uh, the world's uh, commitments, uh, we would be around 2.7 degrees centigrade, which is far from good. Uh, we have also the challenge of uh, financing and the commitments of uh, uh, helping uh, countries in development to finance uh, adaptation needs and mitigation needs. It's also important to unblock this issue at COP26 um, because uh, this is the only way that we will uh, provide enough goodwill and motivation and mobilization of the of all the parties of the Paris Agreement. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. I've, I've heard that the, uh, we cannot expect to save the world at each COP, but this one I think is particularly important. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I, I might just add one other um, thing to keep in mind here is that it's, uh, even when we resolve to do something, it's it can be very difficult to know what to do, and uh, of course we have to um, we have to burn less fossil fuels and we have to uh, conserve in in other ways. Um, but uh, since that's inconvenient, we have these alternatives, ways of getting carbon credits and planting trees and all this sort of thing, and. Um, one of my students is is doing an analysis of how much carbon are you actually sequestering when you plant uh, a small forest along a river 
you know, and, and because this is being done on large to, to scale in uh, some parts of coastal California. Um, and then there's a, a lot of controversy over carbon credits themselves and uh, ways that uh, you can game the system to, uh, to get these credits or they're double counted. And anyway, there's a lot of controversy there. So um, it's, um, Anyway, I, th I think there are many dimensions to the, to the challenge. Thank you, Professor Kondolf. We do have another question and that uh, from our chat, and that is, what is the current status of the carbon border mechanism of the EU and how could it impact the EU-US trade? And again, either one of you or both of you. That's Joao, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll try to reply to that question as, uh, as best as I can. Um, the carbon border adjustment mechanism um, was proposed or suggested by the, the, the European Commission and now is under discussion. So it's still uh, far from being um, uh, finished uh, in terms of uh, what could be the, the final outcome of this, of this, of this mechanism. It is an environmental mechanism, an environmental measure, a climate measure, in the sense that it, it uh, tries to stimulate um, parties or economies that don't implement uh, the same level of standards and don't have the uh, are not aligned with the same ambition in in uh, reducing emissions as uh, in this case the EU to step up their efforts, and so it will be a tax. That will be um, uh, a charge. I won't say if it's a tax because even that is being uh, is being uh, assessed. Uh, it, it will be charged on those products that have uh, come from those economies and that don't have the same start. So what we're trying to do is to create a level playing field uh, uh, between these products that uh, have or incorporate this externality of carbon and the others that don't. Um, we will have uh, discussions, I guess, uh, over the next year. This will be applied uh, to a very limited the number of uh, products. And uh, if my mind doesn't fail me, we're talking about cement, iron and steel, uh, aluminium, fertilizers, and energy. We have uh, an interesting example I can pick up on energy and to explain how this works is that uh, we have power lines between the Iberian Peninsula and Morocco. And at a certain point, because of the way that those contracts were made, we were seeing uh, uh, energy being injected from Morocco. This power line was first built to, to inject renewable energy into, into Morocco, but then Morocco decided to build uh, coal-fired power plants. And uh, because of the condition change and uh, because it was uh, fixed on the price, the, the pathway was reversed. So we were seeing the injection of cold, cold fired energy into the EU. And this is absolutely contrary to what we're trying to do internally by reducing emissions. So these are the type of things that the carbon border adjustment mechanism tries to uh, um, avoid uh, these, uh, the, the, and this also links to what uh, Professor Matthias Conolf was saying, uh, the, the need that we have to have robust systems to be, um, uh, that there's no double counting and overall there's no undermining of the objectives that we want to, to achieve, we cannot afford. The EU can, has to look uh, into things, into the economy and it's all its value chain. We don't want, to reduce emissions internally and be the ones that are creating an incentive to for those emissions to be produced outside. This is why this is an environmental measure. It will be focused on those products that I said, and I, I understand from my colleagues that are looking into this, this these are not the products that uh, typically we would trade with the United States. And of course, the United States itself is doing its own path in raising standards uh, to combat, uh, to mitigate uh, and to reduce emissions. So I think we're talking about different economies than, than the US at this point. Um, well, I, I think I would like to at this point make it, maybe have one final question. And that question 
um, has a little bit to do with some of the things you just touched, which was talking about some of these uh, hard or heavy industries, industries that are uh, areas of the development, the necessary industries that are inherently not in uh, climate, not environmentally friendly, let's say. And um, how are, is the UN, the US developing partner um, legislature that will address the restructuring of these industries so we can have a more climate friendly outcome or output without the loss of, um, of jobs and, and, and without having a major effect on human life, uh, let's say, uh, from, an, from an economic perspective. How is this viable and, and what kind of policies and strategies are being developed to address those issues? Um, Professor Matthias Kanofa, I'll pick this one up if you don't mind. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, no, no worries, no worries. Um, um, that's a very important question. And I think that um, probably uh, one of the first messages I tried to, to, to translate or to express when I started the, the presentation is that um, one of the, the visions be behind the European Green Deal is that through innovation, through uh, developing uh, uh, innovative products, uh, solutions, services, we can actually uh, help the competitiveness of the European economy. And one of the uh, major part of, uh, of uh, our, what we have to do has to be, has to, has to focus on industry. We don't want uh, industry out of the European territory. We want to fix it here. We want to be able to provide people with jobs. We want the, the industry to be, um, innovative, not only when it comes to climate. Um, uh, we, uh, in the comments that we, we saw uh, earlier on, there was a reference to, uh, by Maria Calapesh to circular economy. So to close the loop when it comes to resources so that we can uh, not be an open economy where things come in and go out and they're waste. So there's a lot of uh, investment going into innovation both on the climate side, both on the economy, uh, circular economy side, in order to, to help our industry to, to be more sustainable. Um, and this is also with uh, the, the, uh, the idea and the, the conviction that this will also help uh, the EU be more competitive and be able to place these solutions uh, in other economies in the world. There's a challenge on energy, there's a challenge on materials, there's a social challenge, there's a biodiversity challenge. The European Green Deal, as I said in the beginning, goes beyond the climate dimension. It puts the, in the center of the, 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 the economic dream, if you want, but uh, it goes beyond that. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, we, we are out of our allotted time. Um, there are questions still left to be answered, which is always good when we get to, an, to the end of an event and we, we still have things to, to go on and talk about. And uh, perhaps we can do a round two at some point, or perhaps some of the other um, conversations we'll be having in this same series will connect because it is all intertwined. And as we just saw, uh, finances uh, will and economy plug into this. It all, it all sort of, it's sort of connected to, to make uh, a safe and secure net to, to sort of hold us all together and going forward and maybe passing the earth down to our great, 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 great grandchildren. Um, and for, uh, with that, I would like to thank both of the presenters. Thank you so much for taking the time for this presentation. I would like to thank all of those who attended and please, please stay tuned to all the notifications so that you can plug in to, the, to this series of events, which will be bringing the two West Coasts ever so close. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Delinda. Thank you, Delinda. And thank you, Joao. Thank you, Professor. It was a pleasure. Likewise.